name is Raleigh Hood. Uh, I'm a professor of oceanography at Horn Point Laboratory, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about jellyfish, which is one of the things that, that I study in Chesapeake Bay. Um, I've been studying jellyfish for a little more than 20 years now uh, uh, with a, a, a number of students that I've had over that those 20 years. The, the organism, the jelly type of jellyfish that I have mostly focused on over these last 20 or so years is the sea nettle. The species name is called Chrysiora quinquacera, and it's, it's the big medusa, medusoid, uh, stinging jellyfish, milky white colored, with long flowing tentacles and oral arms that, that if any, in, anyone who spent any time on the Chesapeake Bay in the summer has seen them and perhaps encountered them and become stung by them. Um, and and we've, been, we've studied their behavior, we monitor uh, their abundance, and we've done uh, a variety of different types of scientific investigations. For example, we've developed the ability to broadly predict the probability of occurrence of sea nettles, and, and we actually have a, a, a forecasting model that you can go on the web and, and find out if uh, uh, today or this weekend it, the likelihood that you're going to encounter stinging sea nettles in Chesapeake Bay. Um, we've studied their their feeding behavior. Sea nettles are, are quote top predators in the marine ecosystem and we're trying to better understand how how these top predators impact the entire uh, planktonic ecosystem in, in Chesapeake Bay and, and uh, we know now that there uh, that there's probably long-term declines in sea nettles in Chesapeake Bay, and we're trying to understand how these changes in the abundances of these top predators is going to affect the marine food web and other organisms like fish uh, in Chesapeake Bay. Hi, my name is Jacqueline Tay, and I'm a graduate student that's working with Raleigh Hood at Horn Point Laboratory. And um, I guess I wanted to start off by telling you about the life cycle of the sea nettle in Chesapeake Bay, because most of the time what people see is um, this large medusa, stinging medusa, in the summer. And they don't actually know where these jellyfish are coming from. Do they swim from outside of the bay? Where are they coming from? Actually, they're living in the bay all year long. Um, but they, they have two stages. One is the medusae, which you see in the summer. And they have another stage that lives throughout the year, and it's called a polyp. And um, I looked this up before I came. Uh, a good size comparison is a, a, a little tiny three millimeter piece of lead that's 0.7 millimeters. They're that small, and so that's why we don't see them. Those polyps live mostly on oyster shells. They need something hard to live on. And then in the spring, um, they're cued by temperature and salinity is really important to reproduce asexually. So it's this tiny little, almost you would think of it as a tiny, tiny plant, but they make, um, they segment themselves into little discs. And they can, each of those polyps can make four to 10 discs. And each, and when the discs are mature, they will pulsate. Um, to break off from the stem. And each of those tiny little discs is now called an ephyra, which is just the baby stage of the medusae. And they will eat and eat and eat until they grow into like the baseball-sized medusae that we see in the bay. What I'm working on right now is looking at the, the ecosystem role of jellyfish. And so a lot of people might ask, what are jellyfish useful for? And it's not that they're useful, but they do play a role in the ecosystem. They eat um, other jellyfish, the tinafore comb jelly, and it actually really regulates their population. So comb jellies um, are hermaphroditic and they, they can just reproduce like crazy. And without the sea nettle preying on them, their populations can explode. And, at, um, and, and the real issue with that is that comb jellies um, eat a lot of crustacean zooplankton or copepods, which is the same food that larval fish eat. So they become, they can really basically locally exterminate all the food for larval fish if, um, 
sea nettles aren't there to kind of regulate their populations. So that's what I'm kind of looking at through computer models or simulation modeling, um, looking at different scenarios. When, if there are a lot of sea nettles, what are the impacts versus if there are few sea nettles, what are the impacts? And the benefit of using a computer model is in, in the wild or in the field as we call it, a lot of things are changing simultaneously. It, there could be a lot of river flow or a little river flow, a lot of nutrients or a little bit of nutrients. And so it's really hard to tease out um, just the effect of jellyfish. And so when we wanna do that, the best way is to explain that with mathematical equations and see if we can reproduce what's going on um, in the field. And then we can kind of play games with just turning jellyfish, just playing with jellyfish um, and see what those effects are. We actually don't have a lot of long-term information about how many jellyfish there are in the bay where, and where they are. But in, in the Chesapeake Bay, we have one of the longest time series of sea nettles that started in the 1960s at our sister laboratory, Chesapeake Biological. And that consisted of a scientist named Dave Cargo walking out um, on the CBL pier every day um, until he found out, oh, these only exist in the summer. Then he restricted it to um, walking in the summer. And so a previous graduate student started a, a similar jelly walk um, at the Horn Point Laboratory, and I've continued that. Um, we've done that since 2005. And what we're currently working on is something called a jelly cam, which is to set up a camera that's downward facing so that people can um, will have the opportunity to watch and it would also help us collect data a little bit easier.